Man, I gotta say, San Francisco is one of the most beautiful cities in the entire country, let alone maybe even the world, uh, if you've ever been there. Uh, in California, despite how hellish it's become over the last so, so often, it's one of the most, I mean, it is the creme de la creme of America. And it's really uh, been the crux of American penitentiaries, American... Uh, the archipelago, as it were, that I talk about, but that I mean uh, how the history of how our country became a prison state, a, um, a third world country with nukes, a banana republic in some regards. Um, and this really starts all the way back in 1852 with San Quentin and a bunch of other prisons that we're going to talk about on this channel, as well as the security state that lingers above all of us, like a d sword of Damocles. Without further ado, early convict at San Quentin State Prison. That because I did not want to give the prison officials the satisfaction. The crossing with According to an unclassified summary of the March Intelligence Assessment, the two most lethal elements of the domestic violence extremist threat but they key in the lock themselves. So. There wasn't any stickings. God knows how many people have been killed or stuck since I've been here. I've been here going on six years now. But in the first seven days, two people were killed here. <clears throat> as I've said in my previous essay, available as video and podcast, uh, and I'll put that up on, at the end of this video, uh, the prison actually had a really interesting for-profit model in which inmates would go out to the town of San Quentin around the prison to work jobs that would both mitigate their own personal costs, you know, give them a little money for tobacco and toiletries, probably vices mixed in there, as well as earning revenue for the prison itself so they could recoup the cost of housing these criminals. A new civilization itself was really uh, tenuous in this part of the country. And by the time the Civil War ended, there were, were uh, several native shops producing specialized equipment for the state's first government. And there was a foundry, a textile mill that made netting and uniforms, farming, all kinds of industry um, and that still live on today. And the California Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, CDRC as it's known, uh, says the, that vocational rehabilitation was the objective of early incarceration, unlike other penitent, silent treatment systems of the day. <clears throat> it says, early penal institutions around the world focused on incarceration and punishment. The same was said about San Quentin in the beginning. Over time, the mission evolved to include methods of rehabilitation. Early job training programs involved construction, agriculture, and manufacturing. Now, you can notice that those three things are both all like hard labor, and really you were sentenced to hard labor in this beginning era. Um, so it's funny, they'll teach you the things that will make them money or are um, industrious and worthwhile in a pro-social way to society. Um, so people wore their own clothes when they were locked up in San Quentin. Uh, and the first train robbers and highwaymen of the early antebellum period were housed within St. Quentin's forlorn walls. This was the Wild West, and the actual living standards would be appalling to the modern observer, but when compared against the actual or the usual brutish life during this area, it wasn't nearly as bad as one might originally surmise. But funny enough, when I hear about the conditions prisoners live un under in the frontier days, it reminds me quite a bit of Mexican and South American prisons today. Or so I've heard through the grapevine and immigration detention centers, <laughs> or A-Center. Um, whenever these guys see our modern cushy jails, they just laugh their asses off. <laughs> uh, for real. Uh, yeah, it's like, holy shit, you don't even get a bed in Mexican jail. So, Which is very similar to how San Quentin was in the beginning. Frank Hauser, Lang, Smith, Lowell, let's go. A scoundrel's paradise. But with barbaric conditions came bars for drinking, opium, prostitution, and even a little gambling if your money was right. 
inmates were required to have were required to have a job, but in exchange for their cooperation in this regard, there were lots of liberties given to the men and women that would be unimaginable today, at least uh, on the above board type situation. A paradise, a paradise for scoundrels was how people would describe the prison. It was the running nickname, the sobriquet, if you will. And even though the early wardens stressed job rehabilitation, most of them simply contractors or men with experience garrisoning troops during the Civil War, the penitentiary was basically an open camp for degenerates, leaving them to their own devices. Rehabilitation was as far from the actual motive in those early days as as far as early Californians were concerned. Harsh punishments were the order of the day, and that included capital and corporal, corporal punishment. In case you don't know the etymology of those terms, they're Latin in one origin, or in origin, uh, one of them meaning head and body, respectively, as in punishing of the body and lopping off of the head. So corporal punishment, corpus, you know, body, and cap, capo, you know, capitation, decapitation. <laughs> uh, so that's what that means. The Sixth Amendment precludes cruel and unusual punishment, though. Uh, but it took many challenges to the law in order to get the state of California to stop running San Quentin like the unholy Inquisition, if you will. The prison was literally a few barracks where the inmates retired to their grim circumstance, coming home to lay their head after a long day working in town, securing, of course, uh, not to let these psychopaths out of their hole. And right uh, at the beginning of the Civil War it was when they changed around the uniforms. And it, I'm sure you've heard of or seen the uniforms, the old, the, the jail uh, house, the uh, jailbird off of the Monopoly set. <clears throat> if the cons acted up, they'd have the old ball and chain uh, installed on their leg. Literally a kind of cannonball uh, attached to a leg iron that they'd carry with them. But for the most part, it was about keeping the industries humming along. Below you see a foundry in operation in the article. If you go see the article, you check this out. But I'll, I'll shine, put it forward here. Typifying the kind of hardcore industrial output that was expected in the 20th century, as when people were sentenced to a place like San Quentin, they called it hard labor. And it was just that. Streets. For me out there, um, it's a constant pressure to uh, at least give the appearance of conforming. And I don't understand the streets. Um, I got physically ill the first time I faced a crowd after I come off the road. First Wardens of San Quentin. In the first three decades from 1854 through 1880, the executive level official at San Quentin ranged from the private contractors who hired the inmates for work in a number of industrial shops located on the grounds. There's a photo gallery here I've included on the Substack version of this, but you're going to get to check it out on the video. For one of the first people that ever served in the warden's position was the lieutenant governor himself back in the early, early times. The first true warden was a man named Josiah Parker Ames in 1880, a, a veteran of the Mexican War. He was honorably discharged in Monterey in 1848. That's a fundamental year, too, and there's a reason why uh, California became part of the Union in 18, or 1850. Because 1848 was when the revolution burst out all over the world. Um, socialist revolution, all kinds of re revolution. Which was Mexico uh, got rid of the Spaniards and we took over this land. <laughs> and prison experience wasn't a requirement to hold the w warden's post. Because nobody could have prison experience really. Uh, mind you, most prisons were on prison ships. Like the Waban. Um, which was the original incarnation of San Quentin. He couldn't, um, and we see in Ames' appointment that the only prerequisite and qualification for the position, uh, to which the governor responded, actually, I'm looking for someone with a fresh viewpoint. Apparently, he did something right, because Johnson took over San Quentin after Folsom from 1913 to 1924. Quentin's warden, he implemented major, major changes. After retirement, the federal government tapped him to serve as the first uh, 
warden for Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. This man had served as warden for three major injuries. But even Johnson's and Quentin replacement wasn't an experienced warden. That was the now arcane position of state printer, <laughs> Mr. Frank J. Smith, who served in this post from 1925 to 1927. You know, his small tenures, uh, you know, and this is something that I saw in my own prison experience, usually in Illinois prisons in from 2014 to 2016, you had acting wardens. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be part of any fucking prison. So, including the people running them. ...ignores the squalid reality of violent death. The Western hero has simple religious beliefs. He is truthful and brave. Just the same, he's a killer. Punishments at the early San Quentin. In our own era, it came out that the government and terrors of our you know, central intelligence agency were using all kinds of stress positions in horrific conditions. Sweat boxes where they'd keep a detainee in desert heat, waterboarding, sleep deprivation. None of that can hold a torch to the treatment of men and even some women at San Quentin State Prison during the 19th and early 20th century. Those were all standard issue punishments, especially the sweat box, which was literally what it sounds like. This is, this is the colloquial term, at least used at San Quentin, but it's a punishment that's as old as the dirt that you know, they put us under uh, when it's all said and done. Uh, as early as human habitation, put somebody in a box and keep them there. It's and make sure it's hot, dark, uh, and with cold fucking stone all around you, so you can't get comfortable. Um, any rule infraction could be grounds for the harsher of corporal punishment. As I said, it's the beating of the body. And any time there's a murder or many other less serious crimes, death by hanging or a fire squad would be meted out hastily. Hanging was what was called for by, um, you know, your state law in many cases. In California, that was how it was stipulated. But you could also uh, be put up against the wall and shot. The most common punishment was the hole. The archetypal punishment that is ubiquitous in movies and books about prison. Uh, the jail within a jail, as it's referred uh, nowadays, <laughs> is usually called the special housing unit, i.e. the shoe, denoting the special treatments for which some are housed there uh, receive. Or segregation, seg, as it's shortened. They're a world away from the old school hole, which was literally a dungeon, even more dark than the dungeon itself where all prisons, prisoners live, which were co-ed facilities back in the day, if you can believe that. As I've learned from several works from back in the day, <laughs> Houses of the Dead by Fyodor Dostoevsky, for, for example. It's funny, I've had people comment uh, in a video I did about a guy who was clearly full of shit uh, talking about on Joe Rogan. Uh, like, I bet he's never read those fucking books in the background. It's actually like a fraction of what I've read. <laughs> fucking, oh man. But it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, in Fyodor Dostoevsky's seminal work, Houses of the Dead, it was the second book he ever read. Uh, and he talks about a um, czarist prison. And man, let me tell you, the more things change, the more they stay the same in terms of men and women in prison. And a lot of other things, homosexuality, uh, corruption, gambling, all kinds of stuff. It's like, it's all there and it, nothing changes. You lock people away and they behave in sociologically, like almost like, um, you know, uh, stamped law that is just, this is how people will act. <laughs> Humanity is a universal and all good things that govern it are universals as well. Abrahamic law and whatnot. So, but as men and women, as we we're geared to be, uh, the men were originally like it was housed um, separately from women, and they were desperately trying to get into the hen house, so to speak. <laughs> There's uh, lots of sources about this that they were, you know, basically cooing at the uh, at the moon, trying to you know get at the feminine. Um, you know, fairer sex, if you will. But uh, the worst punishment at the old San Quentin was reserved for rioters. And to those unfortunate souls, the correction officer 
would use a type of fire hose with a sophisticated pump for the area. Uh, they'd hang the prisoner upside down and unleash the skin tearing pressure on naked genitals, usually using, or pretty much as far as I, uh, I've read or could find, they used seawater, like sea bilge. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they sprayed the old dick and balls region, twig and berries. Along with the inmate's face in a foreshadow to the waterboarding of the earlier 21st century. I'd imagine the pain was the disincentive here in this case, or at least the legend of the pain, rather than the perception of drowning like uh, the Central Intelligence Agency has deployed since then. But rape, uh, it's a word that is not good on YouTube, but there's, there's only four letter word, it starts with R, uh, which I will. Uh, probably have to edit <laughs> the YouTube version of the video, but uh, in in this same work, I'll clip some documentaries that'll talk about the extent of these horrific punishments. Um, and but well, I will stress that in modern iterations, homosexuality is already so uh, prevalent among inmates uh, that it's not you don't need to take what can be given for the most part. Although I've, I've never done ta time either behind a wall in a maximum, like a super max security prison, not like San Quentin. Um, and there are, I've heard about rape still being prevalent among certain groups or in certain facilities and certain systems. But in my experience, you could go in, ma in most prison systems, if not, uh, in most prison systems, you're just not going to find it. There's enough homos that are turning out to, you know, suffice. <laughs> Man, I don't know how these guys do it. I really don't. Look at the pigeon nest right here. See yeah. the pigeon nest? Look at the pigeons right there. They go shit on you as soon as you shit in the toilet. Yeah. It's a double shit. Oh, it's a song. Okay, some of the earlier, early notable inmates. According to the CDRC's website, Notorious stagecoach robbers such as Charles Black Bart Bowles and Dick Fellows served at San Quentin State Prison. Other familiar historical names include J Griffith, J. Griffith, <laughs> Emily Lade or Emma Ladeau, and uh, Jean Bessie Barclay Turnhair. Uh, the prison also served a female population before California Institute for Women at Tehachapi was activated in 1933. And all of the hen house operators, <laughs> you know, the uh, guys trying to send notes to their lovers across the way uh, ended in 1933. I'm sure that was a sad day when the feminine uh, variety of humanity was booted away from uh, San Quentin. And uh, I'll be doing profiles on specific early inmates from San Quentin in shorter videos and articles for the publication. But for now, the reader can follow uh, links in my Substack art article. Uh, and also, I got pictures of all these um, you know, early inmates at uh, San Quentin. Uh, but, you know, this isn't even including like uh, Tukey Williams or um, uh, Neil Cassidy or any. There's a whole litany of serial killers and strange people and, you know, cult figures that have done time at San Quentin that I'm going to do little minute videos on and stuff like that for the channel. Um, I just work a job doing drywall, so, you know, hey, you gotta fit it this in. This is my world. I grew up in it. I know it inside out. I know what to expect. Um, it's my frame of reference. You. The first reformer. Throughout the first few decades of its operation, the prison was really a haven for profiteering and vice of all kinds. And most notably, the wardens would, would use prisoners for all kinds of outside contract workers, work as the uh, San Francisco Bay became civilized out of the wilderness from which it came. And yes, the prison was run by a series of sadists and former lawn, frontier lawnmen or you know, uh, wannabe lawmen. Like I said, the only requirement, specifically requirement, was military experience. Uh, many of them veterans who just wanted a stable job. And out of neglect or lack of ex expertise, many who reigned over San Quentin made it a hellish dungeon. But the first true 
reformer was Warden Clifton Duffy. There were some good ones before then, or at least when I say good, I don't mean like some convicts mean good. I mean like a uh, rehabilitative personality who'd, who'd want to see somebody strive for something better than shitting in front of another man and eating slop or, you know, noodle burritos. Um, you know, Duffy was a man of contradictions, and he ruled over the place from 1940 to 1952. Uh, but he cultivated a public persona that was quite positive because of his fresh insights in for- informing the reorganization of the prison structure, as well as reformation of prison management. Prior to Duffy, San Quentin had gone through years of violence, inhumane pr- and punishments, and civil rights abuses against prisoners. And not that those stopped but he actually made it a point to uh, say, yes, these things are happening and we're trying to address it, Um, you know, which made him a transgressive or reactionary or progressive, but to to probably, well, no, it wouldn't be reactionary, but a progressive, uh, dangerous personality almost, the old Irishman Clint Duffy, or, yep, (laughs) Clint Duffy, sorry. Uh, But, the previous warden uh, was forced to resign between 1939 and 1940, and in his place came uh, Mr. Duffy, the warden, Warden Duffy, who immediately had the offending prison guards who were torturing uh, inmates fired. There were many COs who were known for their remarkable cruelty, and the new warden tried to tamp that down as best he could, and not just in reputation, but in practice. The use of torture as an approved method of interrogation at San Quentin was banned in 1944 under his tutelage. Uh, Knowing what a difference in intellectual interior life, as he called it, might do for a convict, the new executive added a librarian, psychiatrist, and several surgeons to the facility's uh, repertoire. And Duffy's press agent publicized the sweeping reforms. However, San Quentin remained a brutal prison where prisoners continued to be beaten to death, not only by uh, other inmates, but by COs. Uh, The prison was segregated until the 1960s. At least black inmates weren't housed with whites. But that would all change in the decade after uh, Duffy's leadership. Two people got killed here the first week I was here. I did seven years flat in New York in Attica. And uh, no one got killed. It should be noted just as a little antidote that the uh, segregation, when they say segregated, uh, the, a lot of the violence in the 1960s was from the, um, oh God, what the hell is the word? Integration, yep, integration of prisons. But they used to have like honor, and they still do have this, like honor dorms, you know? And that was like a backhanded way of segregating and uh, so you'd have like all white units that are called the honor dorms, you know, and basically they got like more privileges and then there's everybody else. And basically, so being not in the honor dorm, you'd be, you should be living, but with mostly blacks. So, uh, it was a way of, you know, holding privilege, basically like be amongst your own kind. And nowadays the prison is just, uh, self-segregated, like, if you were to bring a white guy to a unit, uh, a black or a black like um, section, they just nah, you know, the white guy would throw down his shit and say, "Take me to the hole," and the black guys would say, "Yeah, yeah, we're not, no, what the fuck you trying?" They'd be pissed off at the guard. They'd be like, "What the fuck you trying to do to us? Trying to get us all in a wreck?" So, um, yeah, it used to be forcefully segregated or. Uh, at will, at will of the admin. You're aware that right. you're responsible for everything that's in your cell. I'm responsible for what I know is in my cell. Well, if I don't know, well, some, no, I if don't I don't know, know something's in my cell, I don't know how I could be held responsible uh, for it. You know. This inmate, uh, Mr. Santos, he was able to uh, take these, you know, raw sand oil paint, and uh, just turn it into a beautiful sepia tone mural depicting California history. Uh, and I will probably do a uh, video on this artist as well as an article on my Substack. Um, and 
yeah, because it is something to behold, and it's done. He really does cover quite a bit of the California's history. So, um, and st San Quentin still has a number of the prison industries, you know, as because uh, labor or you know, hard labor <laughs> was seen as the big rehabilitative force at the time, uh, you know, and I think it really is, and I think reading is. Uh, both those things are, are literally, if somebody had a, a skill and could read and enjoyed reading, uh, they would be a much better person getting out of prison. Just those two things. Even if they walked out of the prison telling you they're going to rob banks or, you know, uh, pimp women for the rest of their life, they'd probably be a lot better person if they could, you know, do something worthwhile for society and read. Hurt somebody for just the smallest of reasons. I've seen guys get themselves killed in here for a box of cigarettes. <laughs> All roads to capital punishment in California lead to San Quentin State Prison for men and women. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of the famous inmates who've been executed here, uh, particularly Tukey Williams or um, the goddamn the people who've died on death row and people who've actually been executed. But Tukey's ex uh, example shows that you can have dignity and... Um, actually a good existence while on death row and be a, an influence for change and at 30 years or so uh, you're not putting to death the same young man who in Tukey's uh, instance was a, a spree killer he killed a bunch of people at once and uh, you know a single act uh, that he tried to redeem uh, through his time because it's easy to get just lost in the mix in prison if you have if you're on death row it, it's uh, you can still get a lot of drugs and phones all kinds of crazy shit in death row and by all accounts Tukey was a, a different man so it's been a long list uh, but if you don't know who Tukey Williams is he was the uh, leader of the Crips and a man who reformed himself after he was um, you know, put on to the long list of execution and this is why I'm actually I'm I'm for the death penalty. I think some things are uh, unforgivable, um, but you got to do it fast because human beings have a way of redeeming themselves. And uh, you can't sit there and execute a man 30 years later, or a woman, um, for something you know after they've done all this and that. You know it's it's uh, you have a certain window of time where the moral culpability is. Um, that of which somebody could be let off to be killed. But, um, yeah, once that passes. Anyway, so um, the story of death row and uh, the condemned unit is a long and sordid one. Uh, and as, as we've said before um, on this channel, I've said before, there was no economic uh, int or impetus to keep somebody locked up unless you could extract extract labor from them um and if not you wouldn't just like hey don't worry i'm gonna house and feed you sir for the next 45 years uh don't you worry you kick back and we got this we're gonna do <laughs> do everything for you and bring the tray to your door you just kill the man if that were it um and that's kind of utilitarian, um, but remember who Jeremy Bentham is in this whole system. Um, yeah, the design of prisons is utilitarian, um, and uh, honestly, a prison society is the closest thing you're going to get to true uh, Stalinist Marxism uh, in America. So, uh, But men condemned to death in California must be held at San Quentin while women are held at Central California Women's Facility in Coachella. Chowchilla, sorry, not Coachella. Chowchilla! Uh, although when it comes time for the deed to be done, the ladies are transported to San Quentin by bus before being put to death. California is seen as a progressive state, so it's uh, faced backlash for the size and scope of its death, death row. The citizens of the nation's largest state have reinstated the practice several times after it's been d discontinued by several governors. Um, but right now, under 
Governor Gavin Newsom, there are new or no new executions scheduled in the state, even though the penalty exists on the book. Uh, but because of this massive bo- backlog, <laughs> backlog, uh, for lack of a better term, the unit is by far the biggest antechamber to the gas chamber in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the following that I have to tell you is from the Wikipedia article that says uh, talks about the process. The death row at San, uh, at San Quentin is divided into three sections. The Quiet North Segregation, or North Seg, built in 1934 for prisoners who don't cause trouble. <coughs> the East Block, a crumbling, leaky maze of, of a place built in 1927. And the Adjustment Center for the Worst of the Worst. Uh, most of the prison's death row inmates reside in the East Block. Um, the fourth floor of the north block was the prison's first death row facility but additional death row space opened after executions resumed in the u.s in 1978 there was a um a prohibition or an abolishment like round the country um but there was a decision that states could decide for themselves uh like I said, you know, and they also pl- many governors have decided to put a hiatus onto it, but people are, you know, there's the, there's something to be said for executions, to say that. The Justice Adjustment Center uh, received solid doors preventing gunning down or attacking persons with bodily waste. Uh, as of 2016, it uh, housed 81 death row inmates and four non-death row inmates. A dedicated psychiatric facility serves the prisoners. A converted shower bay in the East Block houses religious services. Many prison programs available for the for most inmates are unavailable for death row inmates. I know like in uh, Arizona, uh, for example, everyone can smoke in prison. It's one of the few states you can smoke in prison. Not so if you're in a max prison or a or death row. Um, you know, which is kind of funny. They're going to uh, extend your life by not allowing you to smoke cigarettes. But, I, you know, there's something to be said for that. It's, it's a privilege, so to speak. The methods for execution at San Quentin have changed over time. Prior to 1893, the counties executed their own convicts. Uh, but as for people getting giving the hardest, harshest of penalties at the penitentiary... Hanging was the prevailing and only way uh, from 1893 to 1937, 215 inmates. Um, so that's, let's see here, seven, that's 44 years, uh, 215 people. So it's about five people a year, four to five people, you know, closer to five. Uh, the gas chamber w- uh, lasted from 1938 to 1995 and killed 196 inmates. So right there, that's uh, 57 years. So that's about three inmates. And mind you, there was a prohibition uh, against cruel and unusual punishment up until I, I think the court's decision, the Supreme Court, um, got rid of the death penalty for all states uh, at some point. And then that law was struck down in 1978. But it only it was only a few years that this was happening. Um, and, you know, states uh, have their own right. Like, the federal government can't just tamp down their um, solution. But um, in 19, or 1995, this is kind of funny, the use of uh, gas for execution was ruled cruel and unusual punishment on top of the already uh, the prohibitions on um, you know, hanging or uh, the, the lethal injection was still allowed. There's a lot of decision or, um, you know, methods that are allowed or that you, a state could do um, per se, but the lethal injection wasn't just like a drug overdose, which I think they should do if they're going to kill somebody. It, it was actually a very painful thing. And, um, but, you know, then they did a four-stage thing where it was basically like a, a sedative that was going to knock you cold, something to, you know, sweep, sweep you off your feet and make it a little bit less anxious. It's just, it's all fucked up. There's no, you're killing somebody, it's going to happen. But as far as the gas for the execution... 
uh, mind you, what you know, we have a history um, in our, and I, I talk about this when I talk about the military industrial complex. We took over the reign of uh, the fascistic state, um, not only with by beating the the Nazi uh, Third Reich, we basically became the Fourth Reich, just like we took over the British Empire. But um, you look at a lot of the actions of the CIA and a lot of the countries they were supporting, they were fascistic in, um, in nature. I think it's just something that happens when you beat an enemy, you take their sword, and um, because what I mean by their sword was their um, psychiatric, got all kinds of, I, I just threw that uh, name of that medicine but they were using medicine and science to wage wars in ways that we had no idea well we kept on doing that in um in our time after world war ii and the jews were you know sent to the gas chamber with zyklon b so it left a bad taste in people's mouth literally and figuratively um to see the state gassing people in this country. That's why it was like, oh my God, this is not good. And then what happens when the state just uh, starts you know, pulling up kangaroo courts and sending a bunch of innocent people uh, to the death chamber. But the original gas changer, chamber that, uh, was, that was put into San Quentin was built in my hometown of Denver, Colorado before being shipped in pieces to San Quentin back in 19, um, or, uh, what was it? Oh, 1938, sorry. Uh, and apparently to watch the execution, the inmates uh, writhed in what was clearly a painful death. And um, if, yeah, if you see a uh, rat being gassed, they kind of just uh, have a convulse. It's not, they feel, <laughs> feel something going wrong. It's like, you know, because you go from conscience, conscious to like cardiac arrest. Um. Thank you for watching American Archipelago and San Quentin State Prison. And I've got a bunch of famous inmates, uh, episodes about the security state, like CIA, NSA, uh, DARPA, all kinds of stuff that uh, is going to go beyond uh, your average prison or San Quentin. Um, but I appreciate y'all. I have a sub stack out that you can find under the same name. And yeah, thanks for your time. Peace.